Do you have a ball rolling around over there? Me? Yeah. Yeah. You sit on a ball. It's a, it's the way to go. Very trendy. Um, you and about 13% of people in this country apparently are workplaces using balls. Hmm. Yeah, we've done we've done our research on this question. Hey, this is uh this is historic. We have uh three of us together. I don't know when Yeah, long time no see, Luke. I feel like Yeah, um... good to see you again. I feel like it was 2014 when I was out there and uh, the three of us hung out at a party as that our sounds... I was thinking that's got to be the last time, but god, we Yeah, it's yet. been a while. Yeah. You know. Was that my PhD? It, it was, and then there was like some kind of after party, I think, at Tony's place, if I'm recalling correctly. Or maybe it was at Tony's place to begin with. Tony's roof. Oh. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Nice. Yeah. Uh, good times. We, were, we, were, we were probably so, I don't know, we were so young and naive then. It was yeah. wow. So much water under that bridge. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I haven't thought about that party in a long time. The late Rob Kafka was there from the Robinson Jeffers Association. And I remember Catherine was so upset at me because she thought I wasn't happy enough to be finishing my PhD. And I was like, I don't know. I just feel like it gets worse from here. And I was not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the correct. I mean, people are always, I mean, on the one hand, you do want to finish it. On the other hand, you do just rush, rush off into what are usually worse circumstances, you know, yeah. some kind of temporary gigs and I don't know, no health to you. All of a sudden, your health insurance. When I was a student, I had at UCLA, I had like good health insurance and like all of that. And like, and then I became a lecturer, and all of a sudden, it was like, oh, none of that is none of that applies to you anymore. Sorry, uh, yeah. figure it out. Good luck. Yep. Yep. I mean, I have just finished figuring out figuring out health insurance for my self-employed situation, and um. You know, like only one company would even take me. And as soon as I said anything about it to any nurses or doctors I knew, they're all like, oh, you're going to get fucked over by them uh, as soon as you file a claim. Like, great. <laughs> so I shouldn't have used foul language, maybe. Um, hey, so what's our Indo-European news to cover uh, this month? Tony, you said you had a couple things. Yeah, just one or two, one or two small items. Um, so we did, I guess, a, we someone asked me kind of like a, a kind of follow up to the uh, when we when we last spoke, someone raised this sort of question of the Hegarty et al. paper. That's the one where they're you know arguing for this um, uh, kind of mo modified. So like you know an early in in you know in, in Indo European homeland kind of. Um, uh, kind of closer closer to Anatolia, followed by like a stepwise migration. Well, stepwise, that's a weird way to say it. Uh, an initial migration to the step and then onward. Uh, you know, it's a pun. Good pun, though. Stepwise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in any case, the, that so that was the idea of the paper. And ultimately, there was a paper that resulted in a much deeper time depth for Indo European, like, uh, you know, on the order of several thousand years. Uh, and so, yeah, so so, so we, some questions had come up and people had asked me about them and, and really good questions. And I think I flagged, uh, well, one thing I flagged was in a forthcoming paper by David Anthony, where he talks about, um, uh, where he talks a little bit about, um, well, he has this paper that it's coming out in the new UCLA conference proceedings, which should um, actually appear kind of any day now. And he has a paper called 10 Constraints That Limit the Late PIA Homeland to the Steps. And um uh, and obviously, he's here interested in the uh, the late PIE homeland. By this, he means I don't love this term, but by this, he means the non Anatolian uh, languages. Somebody says this paper is already available. Uh, it's possible that the, there's an off print already posted on academia.edu or the like. Perhaps that's what. Yeah. Okay. 
that's on academia.edu. Um, in any case, it will appear in the official conference volume. And, and as the editor, one of the editors of this volume, I have to pitch it. I have to say, go out and buy the whole volume. It's full of good things. Um, uh, but in any case, yeah, so um, so that's already available. And you can see his kind of discussion about how you know he doesn't really explicitly engage with the Hegarty Out paper, which again, was not really out when he wrote this. But, um, but if you kind of read between the lines and you look at the arguments that he presents there, um, uh, ba basically, the date that they want, even for the again late PI, that's the non-Anatolian uh, Indo-European, uh, their their date is much much earlier than uh, than fits with all of the types of evidence that he's talking about. Uh, and then most recently, um, some of these linguists from Copenhagen uh, presented uh, a nice little. They put a little. They put. Sorry, I've now lost the thread. They put a a, dis a response letter into the like. You can find it on the. Uh, on the website for science like it's like a, it basically gets attached to the original publication uh and so you can uh you can look at it for yourself here um but basically uh the big thing that they have is uh oh they just have a very very neat little graph that kind of summarizes what uh what are really kind of the i, I would say sort of the major problems that um uh, that people, you know, sort of archaeologists and those interested in material culture uh, are going to have uh, with this paper. And da, 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 let's see if I can show it to you guys, maybe. Let's see. That would be cool. Jackson, can you make me a host so I can... Um, yeah, sure. Or, or, yeah. So I can just pull this up really quick. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah. It, is that my whole desktop or yeah maybe you guys can can you guys see that now yeah i see it yeah okay anyway so this is just a neat a neat little kind of condensed summary of um uh of what of what they basically say and and, and what you can see here are these 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 ver these um vertical lines these are the dates at to which these actual uh, material items uh, show up in the archaeological record, at least in the in the relevant in the relevant regions, uh, and then uh, you can basically correspond these on the tree with where uh, where these innovations need to be. So where these lexical items need to be reconstructed to um, on their model. Uh, I mean, yeah, w w you know the dates that they need to be reconstructed to in their model, and what you can see are some really pretty pretty significant mismatches. So like. One of them would be, say, the word for wool in one. That's the little one here with the turquoise kind of colored thing. That's turquoise, right? Teal, something. My wife says I don't know what turquoise is. Sea foam? I don't know. Sea foam. Jackson, anyway. you're the guy who wrote your dissertation on color terms. What do you think? I'm going to call it turquoise. All right. Clear. Clear. Spoken. Remind me, in Old Norse, remind me, the thing that people were like, oh, they can't distinguish between blue and green. Is that they supposed to be no, another they, one? The 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 actually everybody likes to say is that there's no distinction between blue and black, even though they're totally is. different different subject. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. It's a uh, this is that that sort of seafoam color, and you can see it has to be. We'd have to, you know, we'd have to situate the creation of this. We'd have to reconstruct this word back to like before eight thousand, well, before six thousand BCE, and. Uh, but the actual earliest evidence for wool anywhere in the relevant regions as a proper thing is not until sometime after, um, I guess, 3000 BC, so 5000 years before present. And um, uh, and yeah, I, like another another big one. And, and this is the one that I think came up actually specifically in discussion at our first thing would be these wheel technologies. So these are items three and four. So like three is a really big one, actually. So three, this is the Queclo route for for wheel. And uh, one of the things that happens here, basically because their model ends up putting together Anatolian and Tocharian, uh, in contrast to most models of Indo-European diversification, uh, Tocharian has this word. And so you have to reconstruct it all the way back to the top. And then it doesn't actually show up again until like, uh, what is this, 3500 uh, BCE, roughly. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, you just end up with some major mismatches between the dates that we have to set these things up for, uh, the, you know, the dates to which we have to assume the word for the technology existed, and then the actual dates where we have evidence for the technology existing. And this is bad. I mean, this is, I don't really know what else to say other than it's bad. And if you accepted, um, 
a, a model with a much lower date than these distinction than these differences are just you know if you accepted the kind of standard step hypothesis a date say around uh, I know four cl closer to four thousand years before present. Uh, sorry, not uh, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, so, sorry, closer to six thousand years before present, like four thousand BC. Then, uh, then the, you know, like say down here somewhere, and you push the whole tree under here. Then it's like most of these problems go away, or they aren't so significant. So, um, uh, anyway, I just think this is a kind of you know, this isn't the last word, but I think this is a kind of neat condensation of uh, I think of a lot of the problems that people are going to have uh, with. Uh, with the predictions of the Hegarty at all, at all uh, model, and and then you know, and then uh, basically, I, I don't know, you know, to me, to me, I, I I would take as the next step like people who are who are working on these kind of um, uh, these linguistic phylogenetic models or phylogenetic models based linguistic data are kind of have to go back and uh, figure out what what exactly happened here. This is a super useful chart. Yeah, they did a nice job. Uh, this is sort of Thomas Ola, Thomas Olander and like the other. Well, it's I mean I, the names on the publication seem to be every person at Copenhagen, but um, but yeah, they they did they did a cute job of this. Yeah, you get the link by the way. It's just I, I posted the link in the chat, so um, uh, so so folks can look at it there and inside their little response, you'll find a link to that to that image. And a, a quick question while. Uh... Luke and Claire here. Uh, Claire, to carry in Bible or not? Bible or not? I'm down. Let's do it. Just a, just a one-off question this time, just, just to keep you warmed up. Yeah. Keep me warmed up? Well, my office building was a church, so. <laughs> All right. So that should help you answer this question, right? <laughs> sure. To carry in Bible or not? Are there to carry in the Bible? Oh, are they? Uh, not. <laughs> All right, good. Okay. No. Right. One for one today. You don't. You don't have to hang here. I just thought I'd bring you in while Luke was here to keep him company. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, there, you know, I just Luke. don't. I, I'm so bored by all this Indo-European talk. I mean, I've just never really, never really looked into this before. So you know, Claire. Well, I'm more. About. I, I'm confused because Luke's background isn't his sofa with his green bottle and that one light on him. Somebody's never watched an episode of Word Safari. Why well, watch the so handful? You just outed yourself, Claire. So, Tony, the, the background here is Luke and I, for a while, were actually trying, before I found out this is the hardest thing on the planet somehow, to do a podcast about Indo-European linguistics and such. And mm. one of our... our um, attempts at a sort of recurring humor segment was Bible or not with my sister, Claire. I don't know if you ever met my sister. Hi. Uh, Hi. But um, basically she has to guess if something is or is not in the Bible. But uh, as just as a shout out to uh, Luke being here, I thought I'd bring her in just to. But since I'm here, can I, can we do the same thing? Is it Hittites, Bible or not? Good. Yeah, Claire, Hittites, Bible or not. Is Hittite, I mean, that's not, okay. So, uh... <laughs> Okay, well, first off, I'm going to say Bible. Okay. Second off, I'm going to say that sounds like a rock. <laughs> like a rock? Oh, like Hittite. Like, yeah. Like, oh, kind of like graphite, like that, Hittite. Yeah. A language slash linguistic population. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're in the Bible. Hittites are in the Bible. Well, I mean, it's a little bit. There's a reference. The to sons like, of Heth. The sons of Heth are in the Bible. But yeah, that's Hittite. Really, they were probably the people who they were talking about were Luvians, but basically they were kind of cult yeah. cultural Hittites. Um, uh, these are the so-called neo-Hittite states from like the, I don't know, from the early Iron Age, basically. But but yeah, they're definitely in the Bible. So good good for you. Hell yeah. Hell That's yeah. awesome. There uh, all I got two for two. Tribes. Two for two. Well, I mean, I guess. Hold on. Uh, now, now I'm trying to think if there's actually. Hey, all right, Claire. Um, Galatians. Why do you want me to get it wrong? No, no, no. Galatians, Bible or not. Galatians? Galatians. Galatians. Bible. Okay. All right. And <laughs> she's on fire today. She is on fire. You Three, know, it's three. because, and this is where they used to do the dunking over here. The baptism, the dunking in the pool. <laughs> and that this is the content you wanted, right? Has, has the office been 
what do they call it to make a building not a church anymore, like desacralized or something? I don't know. It's been like this. I think I think it became what it became an office building in like the early seventies. I mean, the late seventies. So, so, so I got some very residual Bible energy. I don't know. They, like, say the, like... they say the buildings are haunted, so who knows who they are? Hmm. This is the content you wanted, right? Kind of. But the people had a big box for them. Yeah, exactly. Well, Claire, we'll, right. we don't have to keep you keep you, uh, you know, listening to us drone on. Thanks for stopping by for a moment of liberty. Yeah, of course. It's nice to meet you, Anthony. Oh, likewise. Yeah. Have fun. Bye. Yeah. So one one thing looking at that chart that I was thinking is um the way that the groups are are kind of subgrouped, that's based on the science paper, right? Uh yeah. Yeah. Because there's some things there that are kind of counterintuitive, right? If you if you look back at that, the way that it has Albanian, Armenian, and Greek grouped i mean armenian greek makes sense but then albanian is a surprise there celtic and germanic being grouped closer together than celtic and italic is a surprise um there's like it's stuff there that reminds me that there were other conclusions in that paper beyond the homeland thing right the subgrouping that was based yeah. on, wasn't it just but, on on lexical yeah these are lexical this is a purely purely lexical thing there, there has been a lot of good research coming out recently that has been increasingly pointing toward a paleo balkan subgroup that, that would actually be not just greek and armenian but also albanian in there um my my, my professor at Ohio state brian joseph has, has kind of been on the forefront of that um and because he's a he's a balkan linguist that's like all he i mean that's not all he does but that's that's a, it's, it's, that's his main thing um and and it, he and some other scholars uh, have 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 been increasingly suggesting that. Now that doesn't mean it's 100 percent right. Uh, it's still you know it's a theory, uh, but but I'm I'm at least you know ad- moderately convinced at this point uh, that 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 there was like some kind of what they call Paleo Balkan group. When that would have been, of course, is under heavy debate. But I, I would probably say third millennium, right? Of course, that's very broad. It's a thousand years, but. Third millennium seems like a good guess for when there there would be some kind of Paleo Balkan group. Uh, what do you think, Tony? Um, yeah, maybe I don't know. Maybe on the te- I mean I don't know. I guess the hardest part with the, the the I mean the Balkan thing is just it's such a famous problem because it's like sure it's kind of looks Sprachbundy and this yeah on their on their, uh, on their analysis here yeah like ba- basically they put everything in the little Sprachbund in one piece of the tree and. Right. It's interesting that they get that result from lexical data because usually the way we get that we assume that it's sort of Sprachbund. I mean, the, the normal evidence cited for it being Sprachbund is um, is morphological, right? So things like the augment and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I don't know. It's kind of interesting, and I, I agree that it kind of struck me as a little bit um, uh, a little bit surprising. So. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not really sure what to make of it. I mean, a lot of the results in here are a little, a little odd. I, yeah. I, I... One, one morphological thing that, and this is sort of on the boundary of morphology and vocabulary, so you could take it either way. But one of the things that I discovered in, in the research on the wine word for my dissertation was that th- those three groups, Greek, Armenian, Albanian, are the only three that have a word for wine in the O grade. So if that word goes back to an, uh, a Proto-Indo-European word for the grapevine, which I think it does, then there that group did something morphological with that word that other groups did not do. Mm-hmm. So there, there, if, if you take that as a morphology thing and not just a vocabulary thing, and again, I think you could argue either way, but um, if that's the case, that would be a morphology thing that would say that those three were ha- had some kind of unity at some point when they did something with that word. Are they? Is, that, is it? Is it that they're the only three with an unambiguous O grade? Because, like, I mean, can't can't like the like you know can Latin weenum and stuff be O-grade? Latin Latin weenum could be, but then the evidence from all the other Italic languages says that that was always just a long I, and that was never a diphthong. <laughs> so, so the, the the good money is on the Latin weenum coming from, from uh, uh, an I with a laryngeal or something like that instead of an oi or a diphthong. Hmm. Yeah, the Anatolian could go either way, I guess, technically. 
Germanic could go either way. Craig, Craig Melcher, when when you know he he helped me a ton on this project uh, with the Anatolian words. He 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 seemed to think it was not a diphthong in Anatolian that it was like a we we we. No, we, I don't think you can get it. No, I don't think you can get it from a diphthong, or at least not without some special pleading. I do think right. you could get it right. from. A laryngeal, as long as it's not the right, it, it can't, like it couldn't be H two. It would have to be like yeah, it's H one. Yeah, it's H one. <clears throat> okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, there's definitely some audit. There's some other oddities that people will try to resolve. But I just, I don't know. You know, when you get this kind of a big mismatch against the a big mismatch with the archaeological data, it just seems, just seems tough. And yeah. I, I don't know. I, I you know. Again, I this is not a. I already said it is not the last word. I think we'll continue to see this kind of get debated and pieced out. And, you know, people who are really interested in the nature of these sort of in the nature of these phylogenetic models will try to uh, figure out what it is that is in their method that's leading to this result rather than uh, a result, say, more similar to um, uh, the results that, get, you know, um, like Chang et al., that is to say, Andrew Garrett and collaborators got um, uh, in that 2015 paper. Hmm. Uh, sort of related a uh, question in the chat. Cameron asks um, whether uh, any of us or all of us have an opinion on whether the Yamnaya culture were in fact the speakers of post-Anatolian Proto-Indo-European. Is that disputed, controversial? Uh, is that disputed or controversial? I mean, it's definitely controversial insofar as we're looking at someone who's making a claim other. I mean, they, they would say something else. It's, you know, I mean... Well, uh, well, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, maybe I should back up. Sorry, a post a post Anatolian Proto European. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess the problem, right, with that is that the Yemeni culture. So I, I'm not a real, again, really not a, a kind of non expert here. Maybe, maybe, probably you guys know this as well, you know at least as well or better than I do. But I, I think the date that they want the step migration to start is just too early. I mean, it's too. It's it's before we have good evidence for the material culture that is a set uh that is that we you know that we call yamnaya right uh i mean there's this precedent culture is right i you know i'm not super conversant with the archaeology in this area either but, the, but like the sredney stoke i think is a preceding culture um, yeah this is all in that that anthony paper that we, that we were just talking about but mm -hmm. i gotta say like i have not internalized all of the it just uh, uh you know for, for me this is uh uh i find it hard to remember these things <laughs> well yeah sure sure i mean it's it's a whole special field unto its own um i think that it looks from what from what i've been able to read about it i think that it's not unlikely that the material culture we call the Omnia were speakers of some kind of early Indo-European language or potentially some kind of sister to early Indo-European, right? I mean, God knows Indo-European isn't just the center of a bush of languages. It could be the end of a different bush. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, one can only be so precise with these things. Yeah. Yeah. Luke, let me ask you about the, just since, since I have you here to the why. What, what did we, where does the earliest material evidence for uh for viticulture or whatever for for wine making wine stuff start is it, i mean i assume it's very early but like it is it's quite early um around 6000 bc um south of the caucasus so modern day georgia armenia uh that's the area we're looking at so it's it's unless unless some of these people who are trying to push proto indo european you know way back or right which i agree with you i don't think they are um then it's going to be before Proto Indo European times, essentially. Now, of course, there would have been ancestors of the Proto Indo European. They're precisely saying that it's very old. They're saying it's like 6,000 BCE. So maybe this is another one that belongs in the, in the discussion, right? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, the wine research is, 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 I would say, somewhat agnostic on the date of Proto Indo European. Um, but, but it seems to show that by the fourth millennium, there was dialect distinction happening, which I don't think is really controversial among almost anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i guess it just to me strikes me as like another one that might be in the mix here um yeah. just as of the I, I don't know what to say like i just my, my intuition is just like there's just uh, you know this is the general linguistics you know comparative historical linguistics intuition is like there's no way an european is that old like it just 
Uh, it just yeah. it's not the stage that I'm interested in. It just I just don't see it. So yeah, it's interesting that these computer models think it is, um, but then the humans almost none of us do. It seems like, um, except for the ones who are looking at the computer models. So I'm, I'm interested in what that disconnect is. Like, what do the computers think they're seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I, I think that would be kind of fun to see how uh, they tease it. I think the last time I was on here, I flagged an interesting little sort of Twitter thread on this by Andrew Garrett, who's obviously in, you know worked on this question, and uh, he you know he pointed out to um, that, you know, they ran the models under a, a bunch of different assumptions in this paper, which, which, you know, to their credit, that's cool. Um, and one of them, one of them, if I rem I forgot exactly the details, but there's, there was one or two models that yielded substantially shallower dates. And, mm -hmm. you know, then you wonder whether, oh, maybe, uh, maybe that this is the, you know, mm -hmm. the, this is the better way to go. Anyway, the, the, uh, again, I, uh, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm sort of agnostic on this. I mean, I think it's, uh, I'm not certainly going to get mixed up in the fine grain details of like, which of these phylogenetic models uh, is the best. I'd sort of, I'd rather cleave close to like, well, sorry, sounds very old school to say, but kind of my kind of, my uh, my gut feelings about how old, <laughs> about how old uh, the reconstructable state is combined with the archaeological evidence, which is at least, you know, quite, quite concrete. And I think points pretty strongly in the direction of the traditional view. Hmm. Uh, question in the chat, uh, I think particularly for Tony, uh, SVT asks, is there a chance that instead of being a really early divergence from Proto-Indo-European, the Anatolian group just has a lot of substrate influence of some kind, given the Hittites came into contact with a lot of non-Indo-European languages that didn't have the same features as Indo-European? Um. I mean, you know, it's hard to say no, it's hard to rule such a thing out, but I, I don't know when you, it's not really clear to me what features look like they would be substrate. Uh, I, I mean, there's lots and lots of, there, you know, there's, I mean, there's a healthy dose of like loan words from, uh, from Hurrian and, you know, a, a few other places, but, uh, but I, I don't know the things that we, the things that we rely on to diagnose Anatolian as old looking or like an early an early divergence uh don't uh don't look like they don't look like borrowings basically mm -hmm. uh so you know like these are things like uh the other non indo european the other the non anatolian languages sharing common innovations against uh, against anatolian things like the feminine gender is really the biggest one um the other one somewhat more controversial but in my view uh, utterly, utterly, <laughs> utterly clear. Um, uh, the sort of taking some, the sort of the the creation of the perfect out of what I what I totally believe is the older situation that we see in Hittite, where you have these two me and he conjugations. Um, I, I just don't see how the he conjugation could, you know, there are still people who believe the he conjugation could come from the perfect, um, but I just think that there's no plausible scenario that has ever been. Uh, proposed of, of any kind um so um yeah um but basically you know the, the big work on this is of course jasanoff 2003 is his hittite in the european verb book and he lays out a series of things that you'd have to you'd have to do to tell a coherent story i like to, i teach when i teach these i call this jasanoff's challenge uh and if people are interested i have handouts that summarize this and so on um but um but basically i don't think this has ever been satisfactory so so all this is to say um, these kinds of features, these are the things that make Hittite look like an early thing. And yeah, it obviously has uh, effects of uh, early contact with um, uh, with uh, Hurrian and uh, to a, to some extent Haddock, right? Like there are famous Haddock loan words in Hittite. But um, but th those are not the features that point to an early divergence. It's uh, it's this other morphological stuff primarily. Uh, and so um, uh, so so I guess my feeling is uh, there's really no good reason to believe. Uh, there's no good reason to believe um, uh, otherwise. Well, in both of those morphological differences that you mentioned being shared by everything that isn't Anatolian really do then look like a shared innovation and not some shared retention, right? Because yeah. Mm -hmm. Anatolian isn't collapsing the feminine and the masculine. Anatolian isn't collapsing the perfect into some present system, which it's yeah, hard yeah. to think yes. of a parallel to that in another language's history. Completely agree. Yeah, I think that this is the, kind of the only, uh, the only way to go on this question. But yeah, which, I, I mean, yeah. 
in which case also i mean there's a different explanation potentially for you know the the no verb right your greek voida your your old icelandic vate um as opposed to those being perfect retentions in a sense you could think of those as being retentions of a system that did at one point have present tense function um yeah yeah just an yeah, alternative yeah. explanation for that yeah. no precisely this is exactly the idea right so instead of saying that this is somehow a weird uh a weirdly unreduplicated perfect it's just like a uh, a retention from a stage where like the perfect reduplication was not a cop was not uh, you know the, the feature of the of the cat the relevant category yeah so um yeah uh, I, you know all of that still i mean you know the tales of that kind of story still is yet to still i think have yet to be worked out in a kind of completely satisfactory way but but i don't really see how the directionality can go the opposite um yeah no and i i think when i first was reading about these questions and i'm talking you know 20 years ago to to date myself i guess um I think when I was first say it out loud. I know. <laughs> but when I first encountered any any questions about Hittite and Anatolian, I thought, well, how convenient that these later discovered branches, Anatolian and Tocharian, don't quite fit into the the picture of Indo-European as reconstructed. We just need to reconstruct it to account for them. But in fact, you know, once you look at the data, once you get a sense of the Anatolian languages, you're like, oh no, these really are different. Um connected, but different. Like there clearly is a split. I don't know the Tocharian evidence as well, but um, it seems like the same thing is true of Tocharian. Mm -hmm. I've never, I've never really looked into Tocharian beyond like what's in, you know, Fortson or another intro like that. I don't yeah. know if you did. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, no, I know a little Tocharian, <laughs> not a, not a, not a genuine expert. Rely on, rely on a healthy uh, contingent of, of good friends to evaluate this kind of stuff. So are you kind of, team Tocharian A or team Tocharian B? <laughs> do they do that? Is that a thing? Do people line up behind teams? I don't know. They have gang signs. Yeah. I'm hmm. trying to do an A here. It's not really working. There we go. B. Okay. So yeah. did you guys make a podcast episode before? I didn't know about this. This is news to me. Did you make any before? We, before? we made two sort of podcast episodes, but like it is. And the second one is still unreleased, right? Well, I can't figure out where it's at. Oh man, that was a good episode. We got to find that. Yeah, I know it had a great Bible or not. Um, yeah, it, did. it is bizarrely hard to make podcast like this. Like I release long form interviews like this as quote unquote podcasts on YouTube. If you you can listen to YouTube podcasts, but the hmm. whole thing of actually putting out an RSS feed and putting it on Spotify or or Apple or whatever, it's surprisingly complicated. And I have all of the technological skill and acumen of someone who spoke Tocharian as a native language um so it's uh it's 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 been a challenge I mean you've been doing this for this kind of thing for a while you're kind of an old hat at it I kind of you know so you you can be humble but I think you know you kind of <laughs> I'm old hat at YouTube <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, such, I'm such old hat that YouTube is passing me by you know like this transition to shorts like I'm trying to keep up but I still put out this long form content. I mean, look at this. We've already been jabbering for 33 minutes, you know, like um, we need to figure out a punchy way to get this into like 45 seconds. Um, mm. I can make it a, and then have it be a TikTok. Yeah. Maybe if well, we can kids up love that. To, yeah, we, we need to come up with a way to like portray ourselves as deadly rivals, you know, so that I can record yeah. like quick 45 second TikToks of me, you know, like hammering onto my students. I feel like you're the you should be the most in touch with the youth, Luke. You're still you teach a ton of undergrads, right? I mean you teach like I do. I do, but they don't they perhaps mercifully don't tell me much about their social media habits. Hmm. That's um, I could ask. I could do a poll in my big class and say, okay, what are, what are we using these days? I'm sure they would tell me. I'm 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 pretty hip. I'm pretty gas, as the kids say. I think that's the newest thing. Um I I don't know what the I don't know what the gassest social media uh, platform, the littest perhaps social media platform um, is, is um, you know, at the moment, but whatever. Uh, I, I do know that Facebook is for old people now. I have been told that. Even um, I'm not. And by old people, I mean us, just to be clear. I mean, um, 
so what else is new with you? I mean, I feel like I haven't heard from you for a million for you a million years. How are how are things? Talking to me or Jackson? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I've seen I, mean, I saw Jackson. Well, oh, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I I I I uh I've had a, a fairly soft landing out of the, the grad school experience. Like, you know, we were talking about earlier. I I, I was fortunate to land a job at UNM uh, right out of grad school, which was originally a, a temporary job, uh, you know, like a two year visiting position. And then it got it got rolled over into a, a permanent position. So uh, so, yeah, I, I, I've been pretty stable um, as far as my career. I've been teaching at UNM. I get to teach some really great classes, uh, fun classes like Greek mythology and, and, a, and a few uh, upper level classes that have, you know, something to do with the ancient Mediterranean world, like magic and ancient religion. Um, and, and although I don't get to teach linguistics per se, I always, I always bring as much linguistics into it as I, as I possibly can get away with. So, you yeah. know, in magic and ancient religion, we talk about the word magos and how it comes from magush, you yeah. know, in Persian, and that comes from the Indo-European root mag. So like, I, I, I acquaint them with all that fun stuff. Um, the kids so, like it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they do. They really do. They like to see connections to things that they already know. Hmm. Yeah. So that's mostly what I've been up to teaching for nine years, um, working on still working on the wine research, trying to get the book published. So, yeah, it's uh, these I, I admire you. I got to say these the kind of um, that particular problem just with this kind of the need to, to do research in all of these different domains. I mean, not to just do the, the comparative reconstruction from a linguistic right. perspective, but then actually uh, sort out the you know the material evidence and yeah I don't know like I had a lot of fun when I was writing my dissertation just learning about the whole archaeological material uh, you know uh, and and everything else side of things and and you know because I didn't know much about that at all that's that's not really my field but I, I was able to you know read as you do when you write a dissertation read everything I could get my hands on um, and, and learn about it. So, and, and try to stay up with them the past 10 years. So that, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun to write, write that multidisciplinary dissertation. Um, the, the challenge is getting that published because a lot of publishers yeah. like multidisciplinary, like, you know, if he, if he says he knows three things, he doesn't really know anything seems to be the attitude, um, mm -hmm. that, that you get from some people. So that's, that's the challenge now, like trying to get it published and, and prove that I actually know what I'm talking about, which I think I do, but that's the challenge. Mm, yeah, I, I believe that. I, I, right, like, you know, I guess I can imagine these review, these edits, the editors, you know, sort of sitting there thinking, yeah. like, "Who the hell am I going to send this to to review?" Yeah, like, what, where do I put this? <laughs> like, how do you even place this kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right that that's often the reaction to multidisciplinary yeah. studies. It's part of what keeps us so siloed. But as a as yeah, an I know guy, Tony about multidisciplinary on Sunday, not this Sunday. Next Sunday, the 17th, at the same time, uh, we're going to talk to an archaeogeneticist from Harvard, um, try to get some orientation about that field. Uh, cool. So that's would, yeah, saying. I'll try to, I'll see if I can uh, uh, zoom in. I'll be, actually, I'll be in your neck of the woods. I'm coming, doing the normal family trip to, uh, to, to go skiing for the holidays. And so we're leaving yeah. next Saturday, I guess. Yeah. So I should. Where are you guys going? Uh, we ski in, in in Colorado, basically. And uh, you have a specific place you like, or you go to different places. Uh, mostly, we've been going to um, we we go to um, we go to Vail. Um, okay, because yeah. that's the tradition. I don't know, it's but, the uh, classic. Yeah, but um, but it seems you know. I mean, I'll be there. and I'll be hanging out, and uh, well, and I'll maybe. try to I'll try to I'll try to zoom in. We've been trying to get Jackson on the slopes for a while now. How's that going for you? <laughs> I doubt I can... Not well. He he hasn't taken his first uh, step or slide yet. No, I I was taught to ski by Sarah Palin's brother. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So now you're an expert, so you can come out. <laughs> um, uh, questions from over here. Jay asked if the shorts monetize the water. Um, Sam asked uh, outside of Greek and Latin, which ancient Indo-European language offers the coolest literature and content to reward the learner maybe three different answers here hmm. like we're supposed to just we're supposed to we're supposed to uh advocate for one I yeah my favorites yeah. yeah team team whatever be be what what's the gassest ancient indo-european language wow what's your take luke outside of greek and Latin? I, I you know i feel like the answer has to be sanskrit here there's just such a large body of literature from ancient india that 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 to be fair, I have not even like begun to dip my toe in. I mean, it's just such a vast amount of literature 
just just taking Sanskrit with Klein, you know, uh, back in Athens, Georgia, and being introduced to that whole world. I, I was pretty fascinated by it, and I haven't really followed up much on it. Um, but but I, there's just so much great Sanskrit literature. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And obviously, the one argument for 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 sort of putting Sanskrit or or you know sort of like doing situated <laughs> as an Indic is like is that you actually have you know you have a continue. I mean, you have a living traditions that continue these languages yeah. basically, or or something like these languages at any rate. Whereas the other ones you don't so much. Um, I mean, as a Hittitologist, I have to make a little case for Hittite. And, you know, it's hard to make the case against everything, against everything else. But you do have this nice diversity of genres. And it certainly is a step up over like, um, uh, you know, I mean, while I like, while I enjoy the process of working on the other minor Anatolian languages, for instance, I'm, I'm always struck by the lack of anything that's like literature. And that's why, uh, that's why it continues to be fun to work on Hittite. You get epic, you get... You know, you get myths, you get, you know, rituals, you get magic, you get all kinds. I don't know. I, I mean, I really enjoy it. And, um, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I got to I got to uh, you know, make a small case for my own little domain here. And anyone interested in that Hittite literature, um, Tony gave us a great uh, uh, couple of book recommendations about that toward the end of our November Indo-European uh, update. I was on the ball. Um, for for my end of this question, I guess my within silo answer is obviously Old Norse, Old Icelandic. One of the best arguments for it is there's lots of cool stuff to read. My outside silo answer might actually be a Vestin. I was going to say, that's a dark horse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I've been fascinated by what little I've read of the Gothas. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I've, they're, they're not that well known, but they're so important for the for literally so much of world history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're really hard that's my experience yeah. like really trying to understand what there i don't think yeah. there's any other yeah. in like early indo-european tradition where there is so much disagreement among like even the principal scholars in the field like about what what these things mean i mean you can go and you compare translations you know uh you can you can you can pick you know kellen's perad and uh and um the Insler's translation and uh, uh, I don't know, you know, Pumbach's um, translation, or and, and you, you know, and you'll get like fundamentally different, like you know, like fundamentally different analyses of individual passages, which disagree in their grammatical analysis on whether things are like I don't know, like a verb or a particle, right. or things like this. And you're just like, how how can there be how can there be so much disagreement at the you know among 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 experts and yeah, it's daunting, well, really. I mean, I think part of that is that the transmission of a Bestin has been so fragile in a sense, right? San the the mm. Sanskrit material has been more sort of protected by the surrounding culture. You know, the the Gothas and, and such strike me as a little bit like an egg that's been handed from person to person and occasionally, you know, like kind of cracked and put back together. And what we've got is, you know, it's got cracks, it's got little pieces missing, it's got like newer pieces put in to, it, it's just harder to, um, to see the whole exactly as it was sort of intended to be mm -hmm. but uh, in many ways we're just lucky to have it at all honestly yeah I mean it's true which, which, all which is why the egg metaphor is, a, is, is apropos that's kind of all the early limits I mean every one yeah. that we have is like it could have uh, you know what one small thing goes wrong and, and it could have turned out a different turned out a different way uh you know, we have just we just have nothing basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, the poetic Edda is one manuscript. Beowulf is one manuscript. Hildebrand's like, like yeah, the Germanic, Germanic, case, Germanic case is such a good one of that, like where where these things are preserved on such fragile um, media, right? Where like the uh, you know, I, I, in some sense, the Hittite is maybe the one that it's least surprising that we have, just because they uh, accidentally use such an excellent medium for that, you know, for surviving basically, you know, clay tablets, like, yeah. like, you know, if those things, if those things bake, like they're, uh, they're gonna, uh, they're gonna turn up thousands of years later, maybe not in great shape, but they'll turn up. Yeah. Yeah. That is kind of a fascinating coincidence. I mean, um, it harkens back to something in a Robinson Jeffers poem about, um, 
something about how like by the next stone age the only tools that will be left for them to discover from the past will be from the first stone age um yeah so, yeah something along those lines our our stuff gets more um more fragile as we go forward in, in time i mean now with the, the cloud everything being on the cloud what is there to find of that Do you know any people with a lot of experience in Avestan? I mean, the first person that came to my mind was maybe Kaylee. Um, uh, yeah, like, yeah, like sort of young, young people who do a lot of work on Avestan. That's a good question. I need to think, I need to think about it a little bit more. My friend, I mean, my friend, um, uh, now the lecturer here in Pies, John Clayton has done a pretty good amount of work on Avestan. He knows, he knows a substantial amount. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's other people who are like, I, but really, he's kind of doing it within the comparative context of, you know, Indo-Iranian and uh, which, uh, frankly, I, you know, I find investing so hard that I can't imagine really doing it any other way. Um, uh, that would probably be the view of my teacher, too. Um, yeah, let me think about let me think about that a little bit. There might be maybe somebody who can come and, and talk a little bit about uh, about Avestin from a less ignorant perspective than than me. I'd be um, interested in that. I, I mean, it's hard to imagine coming out of Avestin without coming at Sanskrit first. Um, there are people who do it though. And in fact, there's a there's kind of a hilarious thing that um, that exists in the universe. The, the guy who taught um, Avestin uh, at Harvard for many, many, many years after Shervo, he, uh, he had his own little Avestin primer, which maybe some people have seen hanging around the internet. And I think I've used it. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we used it. that when I, when I took it with Brian Joseph, I think we used his yeah. primer, yeah. But the the notable feature about it is it's it's different from I think every other primer in the universe in that I think it, I believe it introduces things one case at a time so you learn I, all of the different types of nouns in their nominative like that or I don't remember if that maybe I assume they start with nominative but I don't actually remember anyway the whole point though is you only do one one case at a time which I just thought was such a wild uh, my God a wild idea I mean. I do know one other book that sort of does it that way. And it's like the worst book for learning old Norse. Um, I mean, look, there's such a thing as like walking people into the case system gently, but like once you've got it, presenting an incomplete picture of that chart is kind of irresponsible to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, people learn it. And I'm Sherpa is really one of the few people who kind of, I don't know. I get the sense that he's, very much approaching Avestin on its own terms rather than, yeah, kind of uh, through the lens of, uh, through the lens of, 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 you know, of the better understood Vedic. And personally, I, I just can't imagine doing it that way, but, but he seems to do it. And he's had a lot of, I think, you know, has some inter a lot of interesting insights and I mean, yeah, uh, you know, that have emerged from his approach. So, um, okay. yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe that would be an interesting person to talk to about this. Um, I feel like, I do feel like Iranian gets really left out a little bit just because this material is so tough to approach. Well, it's not just the, I mean, it's the difficulty of Avestin, but also that the fact when you're doing kind of Iranian, like you have to have a handle on all of these, well, I mean, to start just like middle Iranian languages and later Iranian, there's just, there's kind of, the scope of it is huge. I mean, it really... Yeah. yeah. To ju it, just to be a kind of to say I'm an Iranianist uh, is kind of uh, you have to cover a huge, huge amount of ground. And so most people don't. Uh, right. pro probably the best. Thing, yeah, really, the the best example of someone who does uh, who does uh, sort of Indic, the Indic side and the Iranian side at, at a really, really high level of competence. And so can draw their implications for Indo-European. It's probably Martin Kummel and at, at Jena. He's really kind of the, uh, I don't know, he's invested, I think, seriously in in, in becoming very, uh, very competent in a lot of these Iranian languages and in a way that I find um, daunting. Mm -hmm. 
And I suppose that at that level, I mean, yeah, like you said, you're looking at like Sogdian and, you know, you probably want to be competent with, with modern Farsi. There's probably mm -hmm. material there that that's, or, or and, and, and Kurdish maybe, I mean, just so you can draw on some, some modern languages and, and try you know, to of course, of, of, you know, of course, you're one of the people who not a native speaker, obviously, of, of Scandinavian language, but like, oh, I'm going to go learn the modern languages, which will help with, you know, with help with the old languages as well. Do you find that this is, you know, uh, has aided you in your in your research? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, getting a sense, I, I think sometimes people I, th I think if you're approaching an ancient language seriously and not considering its modern descendants and not competent in a modern descendant, at least, you're potentially going to come to conclusions that don't mesh with the actual history of that language. Um, mm -hmm. Not to mention in the Scandinavian languages, a lot of the old research on them is in Scandinavian languages. You can only access it if you know right. it quite well. But also just because at the PhD level, I'm in Scandinavian departments. I have to do modern Scandinavian, and and it helps with jobs as far as that goes. I mean, you know, when I was at UCLA, um, you know, teaching Old Norse, I was also teaching Norwegian. Um, the only reason I got hired at Berkeley was actually because I got hired based on a um, grant the department had for the teaching of less commonly taught modern languages. So I taught Icelandic based on that, and that was like my anchor to to Berkeley. Hmm. So do you want to come to UCLA and do like an old Norse uh, kind of historical box seminar type thing? Yeah, I do that. Be interested? Sure. There's I just there's some demand for this among the students right now and and we haven't had any we don't, we don't really have anyone who can teach that. Oh really? UCLA doesn't have someone doing <laughs> Yeah, tell me about it. They had there was this guy. I keep saying that there was this guy and then hmm. I don't know what happened. I don't know what yeah. happened. I, yeah, it's weird. Hmm. hmm. Uh, yeah, I totally do that. Okay, there, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be cool. It's really, it really is. I mean, it's kind of a shame. Uh, I mean, Germanic on the whole is kind of somewhat, somewhat underserved here, and something that we should try to. It's so hard to cover the whole family, you know. It's like you can only kind of do so much, but, but it's a, uh, uh, but yeah, it would be, it would be, it would be nice to have uh, better coverage Germanic in particular. It used to be better served. I mean, even 10 years ago, there were there were more linguists in even the German department itself. Well, we don't have a German department anymore. That's one of the big ones. Yeah. After, I don't remember if it was before or after you were here, but they merged it all into something. The 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 administration views this as a great triumph into, uh, I don't know, like world's language. <laughs> I, don't, I forgot what it's called. Something where like, you know, Germanic and, uh, and everyone else who didn't have huge enrollment basically got slammed into some kind of modern languages departments and right the department the, the department only of spanish other, was able to exist right the department of languages other than english and spanish right yeah, yeah. There's that's a, what we have here at unm basically like there's spanish and portuguese as their own department and then we we are everything else okay that makes perfect sense yeah i guess with ucla classics has managed to stay distinct so far but but yeah i mean right similar similar basic deal and i don't know it 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 basically means, yeah, like where, where, where would a Germanic, uh, a Germanic historical linguist slash philologist go? And is, uh, I mean, this is my question. Every time someone sends me a job listing, you know, like um, the Old Norse job at, at at Washington was open, the Old Norse job at Oxford was open. I'm like, for one thing, they're not looking for somebody who's got who's who's mostly a linguist. Um, for another thing, they're looking for somebody who's a creature much more of the uh, academic publishing world than I am now. But uh, question from the, the comments. Uh, Davis, uh, what are y'all's thoughts about people trying to apply modern formal grammar theories to ancient languages, say Eska and applying minimalism in a sense to ancient Celtic languages? Right. Do you want my take? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, great. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good. I got to say, it's sort of a uh, a way of. Um, I, I, I mean, honestly, for doing comparative syntax, I'm not really even sure how else you go about it because what exactly are you comparing? Otherwise, you know, it's kind of like, uh, 
uh, the way that you, you know, there are no, you know, it's kind of a famous thing, but like really there are no cognate sentences in any means. You know, you can't, you can't, you don't have the examples of the same sentence in more than one language tradition. And so basically what these formal, but these formal theories of grammar uh, or formal theories of syntax say can do is, uh, uh, is uh, draw out insights about like, I don't know, the way that, uh, uh, you know, sort of deep, deep, deep differences at the level of like phrase structure and so on. And, and you can compare these, you can kind of like abstract across, so you can do a kind of, you can get a sense of what the synchronic properties of a language are. Uh, do they, uh, I, I don't know, do they do things like obligatory WH movement or something? Or, or you know, where does, where do WH words um, uh, land? Are they allowed to see in situ? Do they have to move uh, somewhere do they and and where if so and you can kind of uh, compare these more abstract generalizations uh, across uh, across uh, across languages and they may, and on that basis make inferences about the proto language. I, I think they're also good in phonology and morphology and stuff too. But um, but um, uh, but but I think they're particularly important in, in the domain of syntax. I don't in fact I don't really see how you would do it in any other way. Hmm. Um, you know I mean maybe as a kind of evidence or support for that it's like i don't know I, I do feel like we are coming to a clearer if nevertheless not at all, all clear understanding of the european syntax and uh, and that's only really started since you have uh uh since uh since you know basically since the i don't know the 80s and 90s basically when people started applying generative syntax to uh to old languages and the guy uh, Davis here says, yeah, it's, uh, because you can't, right? He raises the problem of the absence of um, speaker intuitions. Uh, and yeah, this is a major issue and not having negative evidence uh, is uh, problematic, right? Not being able to, I mean, it, may, it just makes the task much harder. The only thing you can do is say, well, we don't have this structure attested anywhere in the corpus. And you can then make, you know, if you have a rich corpus, then you can make the, you can draw the plausible conclusion or plausibly draw the conclusion that this is not attested because it's not grammatical. But um, uh, but yeah, it, you know, it, it's not as good obviously as a speaker intuition, and it's way harder to get. And I think that's actually the thing that puts most people off from doing um, syntax on uh, on corpus languages, basically. And I mean, that was part of the challenge uh, that our own professor Jared Klein had in in studying historical syntax was often taking bible translations but then yeah. when you have when you can compare one translation to another you're always dealing with the problem that the translation can be like too faithful right mm -hmm. uh and, and just a calc on whatever the, the the original language is yeah that is a problem that that is i mean i don't know like every i feel like everyone has experienced this like if you've taken a little bit of latin you end up using like structures that are like they kind of exist in English, but like, they're just, you would never say it that way. And you, you know, as you kind of mechanically learn to translate, so you learn to translate like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, like, you know, uh, like ablative absolutes or something like uh, with, with, with often with blah, blah, you know, with right. this, with the troops of Caesar having been defeated by the Gauls, you know, he, blah, blah you know, uh, the Romans Tony set out to and it's like you you would never say it that way in English. It's not like you. It's not exactly like ungrammatical. It just sounds. It just sounds weird. Like you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't say it naturally in that way. With Tony being in Vale, I considered whether I might see him. Yeah, it's just like Tony, it's not, yeah. Well, I'm I'm somewhat limited, but yeah, I'm there for a pretty long time this time. So maybe let's see if we can get together. That'll be fun. And then we'll get Jackson up there a little later on to hit the slopes. Yeah. That but, would be, but I will only do that on the condition that you can find a failed vice presidential candidate's sibling. Uh, I mean, there's so many candidates this year. We can probably find one. I feel like that should be easy enough. Yeah, that should be. Yeah, easy. Oh, shouldn't be hard. Well, if that's wait. all it takes, like I'll run for vice president, and you know, or and then we'll just you know work it that way. Are you a skier out there, Luke? Do you ski at like Taos? I do. Like that? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I got I got the passes this year, so I'll be. I'll be in and out. Luke has a sabbatical this spring. I do, so I'll I'll be driving around uh, to to hit some places. What are you doing with that? I mean, other than obviously doing some skiing, but like, are you? Yeah, as far as like the work that I actually put on my application, um, 
Well, I'm still, you know, working on the wine book um, and and probably a companion volume at some point that's like more more for a general audience, you know, pictures, maps, that kind of thing. Um, mm. I'm I I I would I, I've been teaching this magic and ancient religion course for almost ten years now, so I'm thinking of kind of putting together a textbook based on that because I think I can probably write a better textbook than anything that's actually out there at this point because I've done it so long. Um, and, and then the, the the second the third project, which really is just going to take it, it it's I'm going to like start some minor work over the sabbatical, but it's going to take a while. Is is this whole project on Dionysus? Um, and, and, uh, connections to Jesus. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we, I had a whole seminar on this with the grad students, uh, uh, last year and, you know, been coming up with a lot of really interesting ideas and there, there needs to be more work done on that. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty fascinating topic. Mm -hmm. I have a colleague here who teaches like sort of, uh, about like kind of magic and stuff like this in the ancient Near East. You, you might cool. want to, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. want to connect with her. She's very, she's very good. And actually it's, it's a brand new course now it's going, well, I mean, she's she's had research interest in this domain for a while, but um, mm -hmm. uh, but she's now going to teach it uh, officially as a course, I think, for the first time this spring. So, or maybe cool. Sorry. What's her name? Uh, Gina Constantinopoulos. Okay, great. Right. So um, she's a, she's a she's really I mean she's coming at it from a different direction. She's a an Assyriologist by training, so it's like the, yeah. obviously yeah, the yeah. emphasis is slightly different, but um, but I think it's you know we're still we're talking about the same parts of the world broadly construed and i think it would be interesting yeah. to see there was, there was no major cultural divide between you know any of those parts of the mediterranean and and you know adjacent areas back then yeah that'd be cool i like that i like the idea of this i, I think yeah the textbook that's the next the next step and i'm working on my old norse textbook uh finally much more furiously as it were because uh brenna Brenna Bird at the University of Kentucky is going to be testing it out for the first time in the spring semester with her old Norse students. Oh, cool. Shit, that, that sounds great. All right. Yeah, so a distant descendant of uh, materials that I used in teaching at UCLA at the beginning of the last decade. Your materials were very good. I'm not surprised that you're kind of formalized as a textbook, but I just didn't know that was on your uh, on your on your agenda. I think that's it's awesome. been my next contracted book for like two years. And I got some writer's block about it. I know that probably sounds surprising, but like just keeping track of everything you've covered and haven't covered and want to cover it, it got, it overwhelmed me for a while, especially with all the other stuff going on in my life for a while there. Um, but now with Brenna um, needing it for January, uh, I've got the fire lit under me and I've, I've been doing good work on it. So I cool. think it should be, that'll probably be done by, um, I don't know. It's always hard to promise these things. Yeah, I was but... like, don't commit. I don't know if I would commit myself to anything. No, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I'm backing away from committing. Um, there was a, a question, kind, kind of a question. I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting point. Uh, uh, Cameron said, isn't it often the most casual everyday phrases that are the most poorly attested in ancient languages? And uh, I think it's often very true. Yeah. It's hard to make a yeah. conversational Avestan, conversational Hittite, you know, like. Yeah, it's kind of a joke that like in Latin, you know, in Spanish 101, you learn how to say like, please and thank you. And where's the bathroom? And like in Latin 101, you learn to say like, you know, the Gauls have invaded and are massacring our troops, you know, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, I suppose you get little glimpses, though. <laughs> well, excuse me, of kind of naturalistic. Uh, of, I mean, there it's, you know, it's funny because they end up being pretty hard texts, I think. And so that that also changes when you learn them. So like, I don't know, the closest you get at colloquial Latin other than like, you know, uh, yeah, other than maybe inscriptional material is like, um, like Plautus or something, you know, you're reading through. Right. That, uh, that's actually one of the best sources for that conversational style. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so archaic. If we find something weird, we're like, wait, is this weird? Because that's actually how they talked or did they just talk that way in 200 BC and they didn't by the time of Caesar, you, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, for Hittite, you get almost almost none of this but then you get um uh, we have just a few letters we have letters and uh, actually one of the cute things that they did was uh you'd have uh piggyback so-called piggyback letters so like the scribe would um the king would dictate a letter the Hittite king or something that he's going to send off to somebody else and uh and he you know he you know the scribe would copy it down uh, and then on the back he would 
add a little message to his, you know, to his brother who is also who's going to be the scribe on the receiving end or whatever his cousin. Or, I mean, these, these scribes often came from the same families, and so they have a little cute, cute little, you know, they add a little letter to their to their to their family member, and and you do get little, you know, occasionally in these kind of casual contexts, you get, um, uh, you know, Hittite that looks a little different and has stuff like, you know, you know, hope everything's well with you. <laughs> That's really uh, cool. And, yeah, and, but and it's, it's, a, a cool, it's extremely rare. Cool cultural artifact, right? I mean, because I guess part of what you're seeing there is that the scribes are kind of controlling what anyone outside of the scribe class knows is in writing, so they can just casually write to each other because no one else is sort of seeing that marginal note. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like literacy was extreme. I mean, at least literacy, yeah, literacy in Hittite is, was extremely confined, and so yeah, like it would have looked like nothing to anybody, to most of the people. Maybe not even, you know, prop, maybe not even some of the, uh, you know, the, I mean, it's, it seems reasonable to assume that not even all of these sort of, you know, elites actually were reading Hittite. They just kind of, you know, got it reported to them um, uh, orally or whatever. And I suspect that's the case in a lot of those, those cultures in that, that region at the time. I imagine literacy in Egyptian was pretty low. Um, very I low. Think a, I think there's a famous thing about, one of those, uh, you know, one of those famous um, Akkadian kings being very proud that, you know, he he reads his own he reads his own letters basically kind of things, and uh, God, I should know these things better, but um, uh, but yeah, that's that's my understanding is that it you know it gives us this general you know it gives it gets a kind of funny little piece of evidence that tells you that literacy maybe unsurprisingly was not not super wide risk it's widespread. Yeah, that's an interesting little boast. I read my own letters. Uh, hmm. We take for granted how easy it is to read with an alphabetic system, but you know, with the with those older ideographic systems, logographic systems. I mean, like you know, Jackson and I have done did that did that series on the development of the writing system. I mean that 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 was that was a you know three year investment of your time to try to learn to read that stuff well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, one of the, uh, the and and at least in um, these are less. There are some of these in Hittite, but it's much better preserved for Akkadian, like everything else. There's tons and tons of like um, we have lots of the the things that come down to us are little practice tablets, like where they're practicing copying down things. And uh, uh, actually, those are the only things that we have here. It, it turns out we have a. I just I didn't even know this, but it turns out we have a little a little collection of cuneiform here at UCLA, and I believe it's only. Uh, a bunch of these uh, sort of scribal practice tablets. Uh, hmm. So it's, I don't know, that was kind of interesting. I saw them, I saw them the other, you know, earlier this quarter. And uh, yeah, I just didn't even know they existed despite being here for some time. That's pretty cool. Oh, cool. yeah. I mean, it's, it's also cool that there's enough of these that they can be scattered around a little bit like that. I mean, there's not many places in North America where you can find, you know, like, oh, we've got a couple of runestones or a couple, uh, you know, old Norse manuscripts. Those things are, fewer and far further between mm -hmm. but it's it's fun that there's enough of those little practice tablets out there that people can have them and i guess you can go to the giddy villa and see some pretty old pretty old greek i remember Page there one. being some hmm? yeah go no, go ahead please i just remember there being some artifacts there that had some some cool you know epicoric alphabets and stuff on them they have a few, their inscriptional material, they don't have as much in, inscriptional material as I would have hoped, but they, I agree, there's a cool, there's a couple of cool old things. And uh, uh, one time I actually had a chance to go and uh, look at their sort of, sort of like the stuff that they don't have on display there. They had this, uh, my colleague was interested in uh, one of these little Orphic manuscripts. They're these little, little lead, um, uh, they, 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 they put them on these little um, lead, little books these little like lead booklet type things and um uh and they're very weird these these orphic yeah these these orphic texts uh they're kind of later on in greek and but they have some interesting old features occasionally including uh supposedly one very old word form that he was interested in and then yeah it was really cool like I, I don't know, I guess I, I didn't really know what to expect but I got there and, and it turns out these little lead books are so tiny like they're like you know, like this big, like, you know, kind of like they would have easily fit into your pocket. And um, um, we were able to look at and locate and see the see the word form he was interested in. And there it was. And 
I don't know. It was pretty neat. Apparently, the, the if you if you're looking through like catalog archives, that the sigla for the Getty Villa is um Mal, like for Malibu, and I just thought this was uh, uh I don't know. You know, you get you're so used to seeing these European ones that you're like, what in the world is Mal? And you're like, oh okay, all right, that's kind of neat. I mean, it's kind of cool. <laughs> it's like it's a it's a collection that wears shades. Mal Malibu is also where I ran into uh, Sam Elliott. Um, that's another another subject. Uh, Stella had a question for you, Luke. Um, do you have a possible source for a Dionysian epithet, uh, Psychodictes? Hmm. No, I don't think I've run across that. Um, but he has so many epithets that I'm not surprised that there's always new ones to be running across. Um, no, I have to look into that. I'm curious now. Yeah, what is dictase? Yeah, I'm not obviously psycho is you know mind or spirit yeah. or however you want to translate that. I'm trying to think what dictase. I mean, it's sort of like date taste. Like okay, but like dyke, yeah, what is dyke? right? Docno is, is to bite, but I doubt that's what it is. Yeah. Destroyer, interesting. Okay, Supposedly. destroyer of the soul. Hmm. Right, you got me. That's, I mean that's that that's a good epithet for Dionysus in some ways, but uh, I haven't seen it before. So again, I'm not surprised. Like as soon as you said there's an epithet, I was like, well, this could be anything because he's got so many. I mean, a lot of the gods have just so many epithets, but he's he's such a multifarious god. You know, he does so much. So I'm not I, I'm not surprised. There's always more epithets out there to to find out about. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's like names of Odin in Old Norse. He's got like eighty hmm. something, I think. Hmm. Well, other. Questions I have from one more tiny little, tiny, tiny little update. I just wanted to share um, uh, an interesting paper that I just heard at a conference. I was just in Edinburgh, which was uh, for this uh, historically Edinburgh Symposium on Historical Phonology. And it was neat. I love this conference. Every other year, uh, it's in Edinburgh in, in December, which maybe is not the nicest time to be in Edinburgh, but Edinburgh is such a cool city. It's like, I don't know, I just find it like visually stunning. It's kind of it's got these giant hills kind of like right in the city, basically, or the whole city is kind of on hills. And I don't know, you end up with these different elevations and it's all just, I don't know, visually very striking. Um, anyway, so so I was there at this conference and um, uh, the keynote speaker gave this uh, uh, this paper on, and you know, the paper was broadly on like uh, how we put together um, uh, sort of uh, synchronic uh, phonological typology and then historical linguistics uh, in order to kind of, I don't know, kind of take into account uh, diachronic factors in doing typology, so sort of establish diachronic typologies for things. Uh, and so uh, her, the neat, the, the the case study that she presented, or, sorry, this is the speaker here is uh, Shalise Easterday at the University of Hawaii. And um, it was a very cool talk. And the case study that she did was on adjectives, the typology of adjectives. Now, this is of she didn't she didn't really she didn't really deal with this uh, in the talk explicitly anyway. Um, uh, but the reason this is of course of interest is because uh, it bears on the so-called uh, glottalic reconstructions of the Indo-European stop system, mm -hmm. which like you know of course these glottalic reconstructions. So these are just you know just for the people out there. The idea is the, the traditional reconstruction of Indo-European of course involves reconstructing. Uh, for this, for this, for the stops, uh, voiceless stops and voice stops, and then uh, uh, well, traditionally we call voice aspirate, but probably breathy voice stops, and uh, and typologically this is like a very weird inventory, um, uh, and primarily because it's a weird inventory, people are reluctant to reconstruct for Indo European, and so uh, the 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 theories that try to replace this with something that uh, is typologically more normal and and really this is kind kind of the only virtue of the glottalic, uh, the glottalic models, as near as I can tell. They sort of make Proto-European look normal. Um, uh, they replace the voice series with uh, with a series of, sometimes these are called pre-glottalized, so basically they're objectives. That's the, 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 the only way that it really fixes the typological problem is if we treat these as objectives. And this accounts for a number of kind of uh, you know, I mean, it makes Proto-European more typological plausible. It makes it accounts for some surprising things like the uh, the, the very low frequency of B in Indo-European. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, at any rate, 
that's an idea. And again, these it comes in different flavors. So what are the other two series kind of change slightly depending on uh, what uh, what you reconstruct? Uh, well, they, 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 those are the variations uh, in the glottalic models, but but they all basically say, replace the voice stops with adjectives. Now, what was cool about this paper, right, is this paper looks at uh, the typology of adjectives across the world languages from both kind of synchronic and diachronic perspectives. And um, uh, and they're pretty common. There's lots of languages that have adjectives, uh, lots of language families in which they're represented. Uh, uh, and the big takeaway from her survey is like, these adjectives are remarkably typolog like remarkably stable diachronically, like very, very stable. So like, if you look at, so if you look at a, a, across uh, across the world's languages, there's lots of languages for which um, uh, we reconstruct, say, in the common ancestor of a series of related ones. Uh, so in a, in a language family, we would reconstruct adjectives for the common ancestor of them. Uh, and we would do that often because uh, they're represented in every single language in the whole family. Or all but one language or all but some, you know, one one corner of the language, basically. Uh, and what she's basically uh, at the conclusion of this is um, as near as we can tell, there's not a single language family in the world for which there's really a good reason to believe that adjectives were there in the proto language, but then lost in every single language, oh, hmm. virtually every single language, which <laughs> I got to say is pretty devastating, uh, a, a pretty devastating fact for the uh, for for these glottalic models of, of proto European. I mean, I just. Like, I don't really see how you overcome this, how you would get them lost categorically, uh, except maybe like, you know, some dialect of Armenian where there's, uh, uh, you know, possibly a contact type explanation. So um, so this is really, I, I mean, this is very nice. I just find it, um, uh, uh, it's sort of satisfying that uh, this, I mean, I think this fits with the picture that was already there. The evidence was really never that good for these to begin with. Now, a different thing is like, okay, maybe we should reconstruct, you know, we should reconstruct for pre-proto-European, um, uh, you know, adjectives or something like that and and fix the typology that way. And like, all I can say is maybe at least then it would just be kind of a one-time loss rather than like this wide-scale loss across the family. But um, but but at the, like, for the proto-European system itself, like, I just think that this is like this just adds this is really i don't know a, a devastating initial additional argument uh, against that kind of reconstruction i just and i i i, I don't know i you know it's funny that she didn't explicitly say it and then every single person in the questioning period was or there in the in the sort of the conversation after the talk was like this is the obvious implication so um so that was very satisfying that's really interesting and um you know, even if you do say, well, then maybe adjectives apply to pre-Proto-Indo-European. I mean, what is it that, that doesn't rest on any sort of comparative evidence? There's nothing, as you said, from within Indo-European that suggests that this was there in, in the common ancestor, which is really responsibly what we're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, people have tried to, you know, there's Lubatsky's law and Winter's law, and they've tried to explain these things in terms of platonic models, but it's like, basically every single one of these can be explained in other ways sort of simpler things like phonologization of the difference of vowel length before voice and voiceless stops and and so on so uh, yeah I, I don't know but it, you know i mean people are going to continue to contest this i suspect but this is just man boy does this add to the add to the add to the weight of the evidence against it yeah hmm. that's interesting i mean to, to draw on that on that topology i mean yeah Proto-European does look typologically weird. It, yep. There's a lot of interesting questions about that, but um, but that is is that sounds like a pretty firm refutation of the glottalic theory for sure. I loved it. I, I really enjoy. I mean, she was just so uh, just so presented this, you know, this it's, it, it was so understated. You know, it was um, uh, it was lovely, and I I'm kind of hoping that the uh, that, that the paper will come out soon, so I can kind of send people in that direction. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, it was a reminder of like, why do we go to these conferences? You know, I traveled to Edinburgh. Um, I mean, again, I, I kind of have this uh, interest in Edinburgh, but but it was like, I flew there on a red eye. They canceled my flight connection from London to Edinburgh. I had to take an overnight bus then oh, to, get, <laughs> to get to the conference on time to give my talk. 
you know, was there for, you know, two, you know, one and a half days or something or two days or something. And then had to, you know, after the, after the after conference drinks had to, you know, go back to my room and basically just pack up my stuff uh, at two in the morning just to make sure I could get to my flight by six, um, only to have it delayed until noon and miss my connection back to LA. Uh. And, then, and so you're like, this whole thing, was it, was it worth it? You know, did I, and, and oddly, like, yeah, I guess it kind of was. I enjoyed my paper. I enjoyed talking to some people. I enjoyed this keynote. There were other cool things. And I don't know. Edinburgh Symposium on Historical Phenology. Pretty good conference. Well, you suffered for it. I I am not a patient traveler. Um that that would have that would have worn on me pretty hard. If you have kids, if you have if then it will help you be a, a more patient individual traveler because yeah. you will always there will always be the moment where you're like, this is horrible and shitty, but how bad would this be if my kids were here right now? <laughs> And uh, that that's that's always the that's the the key to to to, to just being long suffering. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only I'm the only child I have to deal with at this stage of my life. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that, I I appreciate that update. That's that is that is well. Uh, it sounds like well well worth a read once that article is out. I'm here to bring the news. I'm here to bring the news. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other uh, news items or uh, down in the comments, any questions? I'm about to have to go soon, so I think right. I can stay another minute or two, maybe. All right. Well, um, thank you, gentlemen, both for being here. Thank you for uh, taking the time. I've enjoyed these check-ins, and I'd like to probably continue doing these on a roughly monthly basis. Um, are we still thinking about doing the reading for January? We want to talk about that. I like the idea of it. I do. I'm, I'm yeah, still interested. interesting. Like, yeah. Okay. Just, well, well, let's talk about it uh, off, off mic, as they say. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you. All the best to you. Patreon, thank you so much for your support. Thank you for coming and bringing you great questions in and reflections. And uh, hopefully see you for another one of these uh, in January. And yeah. Um, for other interviews coming up in the next seven, eight days. Yeah. Look Thanks forward. for organizing, Tony. Good great to see you again. Luke. Yeah, great to see you. Likewise, Jackson. Take it easy. Right. Bye. All All right. Take care.